So I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, Libertarian Party of California, you guys represent an enormous number of libertarians. You represent a diversity of thought. I'm happy to come and talk to you a little bit about what I've been talking about on the campaign trail, where I hope to see the liberty movement going, and how, hopefully, we can have some ideas that we agree upon in ways that we are communicating libertarianism better. So very briefly, uh, my name is Dan Fishman. I am the political director of the Libertarian Party of Massachusetts. I was also the Northeast Director of the Johnson Weld Campaign in the 2016 campaign. Uh, I have a radio show on the air called Liberty on the Air. Uh, check us out, libertyontheair.com. Uh, and I am currently running for auditor in the state of Massachusetts, auditmassachusetts.com. When I do this talk at a college, I say, please, pull out your phone right now. Type in auditmassachusetts.com. Just getting the traffic makes a difference. It shows up on things, so auditmassachusetts.com, please. Go there and check things out. So, who knows what this is a picture of? Somebody's going to know it. Norman. D-Day. D-Day, I heard it. That's exactly right. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the uh, recognition here because the last time I gave this speech at a college, somebody said, oh, that's Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> the Victor's Right History. I had the good fortune to go and study in England for a year. Uh, and one of the classes that I took there was a history of World War II. One week each taught by one of the Allied professors. So, you guys know the American version of World War II, where our economic might bailed out the world and uh, we won the war. The British version of World War II isn't particularly dissimilar. How the British held out until uh, the Americans finally decided to get involved, and then how Churchill stopped Roosevelt, who was incapacitated by polio, from giving away Eastern Europe to the Russians. The Russian version of World War II is how uh, the English and Americans wanted the Germans to kill all the Russians, but the Russians were too strong, so they were able to uh, resist and kill the Americans and English decided to help them. And the French version of World War II is how we cunningly pretended to surrender so that we could sabotage the Germans from behind their lines. <laughs> no mention of Vichy, none of the other stuff that uh, you, know, you would think are critical parts of World War II. The victors write history. World War II is a really good example, but there are other ones in the past. After a while, le deluge, who knows this quote, who said, yep, Louis, exactly right, Louis XV. Louis XV saw the French Revolution coming. Same class I took when I was going to school in England. After we did the World War II bit, we studied the French Revolution. All we read were primary documents, newspapers written in Paris during the Revolution. Nobody's interpretation of them. On the day of the Bastille, that the Bastille was stormed, in the peasant paper, Bastille storm, political prisoners free, castle torn down. In the mercantile prison, uh, in the mercantile paper, it said, huge traffic jam at the Bastille, fresh goods spoiled in transit. In the clerical paper, in the church's paper, it said, hundreds of immigrants in, injured in rioting at the Bastille. Church aid offers aid. And in the royalist paper, it said, Today, the king went balcony. As far back as 1790, there is bias in the media. And so when we complain about bias in the media, we should realize that this is not a new thing. So we know that the victors are writing history. We know that the media is giving us a colored image. What we know is that right now, our society has fundamentally been programmed against liberty. And we, as the last bastion of liberty on the planet, have an obligation to stand up for it and to speak out and to enunciate what we see as the threats to our liberty. One of the phrases that drives me nuts is when people say, I have a right to health care. In libertarians, we believe two fundamental principles. Number one, you own yourself. Number two, don't use aggression against other people. A right to health care implies that you have a right to somebody else's labor because health care is provided by somebody else's labor. We don't believe that. We fought a war in this country saying one person cannot have a right to another person's labor. We have a learned helplessness that is in our society. A great example of this is that when people are in aid, who in need of aid, the government acts to prevent them from getting aid from private citizens. Michael Bloomberg, when he was the mayor of New York City, ended a, a many year long practice of every night at midnight, cars would drive around to the restaurants, pick up food, 
and bring it to the shelters. Michael Bloomberg said, that's not fair, we can't do that. That food is not being inspected by anybody, and it could be unsafe. People could die from eating this food. Now, obviously, if somebody walks into the restaurant at 11.55 and orders it, that food is completely safe and legal to be served, but magically at 12.01, it will kill people. That's what the government wants you to believe. They want you to learn that you are helpless to defend yourself without the government getting involved. The nanny state. I don't have to explain it in this company. We understand that along the way, the government sets itself up to take away from us the idea that we are responsible for caring for each other. And that is the greatest loss that has happened to our society. The idea that you and I are connected in a community with an obligation to each other that is not given by government. It's not given by any force except for the fact that we are humans together. Libertarians recognize that more than anybody else. We talk about the idea of the ultimate minority, the individual. We are individuals together. And we recognize the fact, the cult. We say it in our uh, mission statement. We, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. So, way back in the day, before I was a software engineer, before I became active in libertarianism, I was a special education teacher. I was teaching in Liberty Hill, Texas, a little town north of uh, Boston. And while I was there, it was a residential facility. We had a group of kids come in from Waco who had been in the David Koresh compound. These kids, when we tried to reach them, we were having a hard time. They had been programmed against liberty. Everything that we were going to try to say to reach them, we weren't able to do. And eventually we had to have a specialist who worked in cult deprogramming to come in and talk to us. And he said, here's the thing. These kids, because they've been programmed against you, you're not going to be able to reach them in conventional means. And let me give you a scenario to imagine what this is like. Imagine that there's an arsonist. And when he sets building on, buildings on fire, what he wants is for people to be inside when the building is set on fire. And so in order to make that happen, he dresses up like a police officer and he knocks on the door, says, I want to let you know there's a sniper in the area. If you come outside, he's going to shoot you. So please stay in your house until another police officer comes by and tells you that it's okay. And then he goes out back and he lights the fire. The house starts burning and he walks away. If you see that happen, how do you convince the people inside to come outside? If you ring the door and say, there's a fire, there's a fire, come outside. They're not going to come outside. If you try to pull them outside, they're going to fight you even harder. The only way you can reach them is to say, excuse me, I smell something in the air. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's smoke. And, I, and then over behind the house, there's this thing. I touched it, and it's hot, and it burned me. But I don't know what it is. Can you look at it? And they'll come over, and they'll look at it. Oh, my God, the house is on fire. Then, you've reached them, when it becomes their experience. Republicans and Democrats have been burning down our collective house for the last 150 years. We are the ones who have to bring in the deprogramming to bring them out. What libertarians? <laughs> that is a familiar chart. 11% Republicans, 9.5%. Democrats, 19% those roads, 60% libertarians. A lot of times I hear people say, oh, I'm, I'm a big tent Republican, I'm a big tent Democrat, I'm a big tent Libertarian. Libertarians don't believe in tents. If you think you ought to be able to look up and see the open sky, you're a Libertarian. And we have room in our pasture where everybody wants to be able to look up and see the sky. And that's a big difference. One of the things that separates us, this idea of big tents, little tents, intents, we burn with an intensity. We burn with an intensity that comes from the fact that libertarianism is the political expression of loving humanity. Every one of us has come to this philosophy because there's something about us, the minority of the individual. I'll use myself as an example. I grew up, I was athletic, I loved musicals, I was Jewish, I lived in Texas, I liked the Dallas Cowboys. Things that make me different. 
And I love the fact that this country has always provided to me an opportunity to express my difference and applaud me for it. Say, yes, we're all different. We are in a society where we are meant to thrive together in liberty. When we talk about liberty, we also have to understand that liberty and balance, liberty and equality are on a balanced scale. If you want absolute equality, you have to have absolutely no liberty. Because given a little bit of liberty, people will do what they can to become unequal. And for libertarians, we applaud that. But when we bring our message, we have to understand that for those who worry about their loss of equality, we have to make it clear to them what liberty actually means. If you think about the movements that have been the hallmarks of the liberty movement, the civil rights movement I point to recently, gay rights movement, movements that have said people are allowed to be who they are supposed to be, the reason that they were able to reach people, the reason that they were able to talk and move people past what had been their old biases is because they came there with the message of the fact that what we represent is a love for everyone, not just for ourselves, our special group, but for the idea that the principles that you have, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, all we ask to America is that you be hold true to your principles that you wrote somewhere I read about freedom of speech, somewhere I read about freedom of religion, of freedom of religion. This idea of equal rights, libertarians understand the balance that we have to allow people to have liberty, maintain equality of opportunity, but we have to comp we have to make sure that we reach the people who are worried about what quality will, what quality they will lose if other people gain liberty. One of the things that we have to recognize, one of the potential hallmarks of a truly free society is that in that society there are bad actors. We know that there is an opportunity for violence in the world. We see it in our daily lives. What we have to recognize is that our piece of making our society more violent comes from the fact that laws require law enforcement, which injects force into our society. When we make laws that require law enforcement, we are fundamentally restricting liberty. One thing that every person can do right now to enhance the libertarian philosophy is to say, this law, what is the consequence of somebody not following it? Are we willing to commit our blood and treasure to enforcing this law? Are we going to throw people in jail? Are we going to break up families? Because somebody said, I'm going to braid hair without license. I'm going to give you three examples of really stupid laws. First one, you guys probably know very well, two girls selling lemonade in Dallas. The police rolled, rolled up on them and said, hey, you can't sell lemonade in Dallas without a license to sell lemonade. Luckily for those girls at the time, they said, well, we're, you know, we're trying to raise money for our father's birthday party tomorrow. We want to buy a present. Sorry, I can't do it. A reporter happened to be there. He's like, oh, well, you know what you guys should do? Tomorrow, you should give away lemonade and accept donations for your father's birthday party. And I'll write a little story about it. And they raised $1,000 doing that. <laughs> happy ending to that story. More or less, a little less happy. People who come here from Florida, Jim, you probably know a little bit about this. In a community in Florida, a couple decided they wanted to supplement their income by growing vegetables in their front yard. And the community decided, no, you can't do that. We don't like the way it makes our lawn look in Florida. All we want is grass or pink flamingos. No vegetable gardens. So they fought. They said, it's our property. We live in the city, but it's our property. Went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no. The city actually can decide what your front yard should look like. If you want to grow vegetables, grow them in the backyard. That's a terrible, terrible precedent for liberty. And my favorite statement about this is, think of all the things that you can do for free. How can the government make that illegal? You ought to be able to grow food, right? You ought to be able to braid hair. We've heard the story, uh, Jim Gray talked about it earlier in the uh, speech, about how people who are braiding hair are being forced to get licenses. How can it be illegal to give something away for free? Now, these were all trivial examples, but there's a powerful example. Eric Garner, who had had problems with the law, not a saint, hustler. One of his hustles was every day on the way home, he would go into the bodega and he would buy a pack of cigarettes in New York City, 
and it would come out and he would sell them loose, the vernacular of the Lucy. Pack of cigarettes cost $14 in New York City, or at least it did when I made this, I don't know what it is now. He would make $6 selling loose cigarettes, he would go back into the bodega, he would buy hamburger or chicken, something to take it home, something to take home to his five kids, and they would eat. He had had a couple run-ins with the police before, because the worst thing you can do is to violate tax law. Right? Tax law is where government gets its money. If you are reselling loose cigarettes, the government is concerned because that's tax money they could be getting. People should be buying whole packs of cigarettes because the government actually gets paid on those. Eric Garner didn't want to go to jail. He said, officers, please, I have a family, I want to go home, I'll give you the money, I'll give you the cigarettes. He's like, no, you know, we've had run-ins with you before, you're coming downtown. He's like, I can't come downtown, I've got a family, I've got to go. And the police decided they were tired of talking with him and they put him to a headlock. And he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they said, if you breathe, if you can talk, you can breathe. And then he stopped talking, and then he stopped breathing, and then he was dead. Because laws require law enforcement, which injects force into our society. Somebody selling loose cigarettes is not worth the enforcement that can result in a man's death. When we as libertarians stand up against stupid laws, against the imposition of laws into our society that regulate our liberty, that's where we start to make a difference. And that's where we start to talk about the thing that we represent, that libertarianism is the philosophy of loving humanity. And that's how we start to reach people. When we talk about the fact that the things that we stand up for, we're not standing up for, for ourselves, we're standing up for, for the idea that we are invested in our community. We are invested in the idea that our liberty that we represent is not for us, it's for all of us. And there are a bunch of issues that are awesome for reaching people on this. Cannabis, of course. Why do libertarians support cannabis? I don't tell people that I support cannabis because I want you to go out and get stoned. Totally okay if you do that. I support cannabis because I support the two fundamental principles of libertarianism. Number one, you own yourself. I cannot tell you what you can and cannot put in your body. Number two, non-aggression. Even if I don't approve of what you put in your body, I'm certainly not going to arrest you for it. And when we talk to people about that, that makes sense. But as we are on the cusp of an opiate addiction that is killing people in our country, there's a story that I tell. People don't understand how the opiate addiction is working. So I live in Boston, Massachusetts. I uh, keep my house primarily with wood in the winter. Every year in October, I stack about three cords of wood. That's pretty physical work. Three years ago, I wanted to do it. I tweaked my back right before I was going out there. I needed to get the wood stack. I had Vicodin up left over from when I had my wisdom teeth out. I took two Vicodin. It was an amazing revelation to me. I did six hours of hard physical labor, no pain at all. I was not impaired at all, crystal clear in the head. It is an amazing drug. As we have transitioned towards a gig economy, there are people who rely on the ability to do physical labor every day to make ends meet. If you go to a Home Depot, if you go to a Lowe's, I need to interrupt you, meeting. That's fine. Uh, special announcement, anybody that's a delegate, we're having a quorum call in the main room. I, I do apologize if you're enjoying this, but if, if you want us to have a quorum, you need to go into the main room for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. You guys are only going to make the can miss the cannabis slide. You're probably going to lose it. I feel like you should just go. No, no, it's so fun. Well, I'm just going. The, uh, yeah. Okay. There are so many people who depend on the ability to do hard labor for one day. Because right now, I don't know what the rate's like in California, but in Massachusetts, Generally, if you're in front of a Home Depot and you have the ability to work for a day, you can get paid $100 in cash you take home at the end of the day. $500 a week, okay? That makes a huge difference in people's personal economy. There are people who depend on that money. People who depend on that money depend on the fact that they can do it every single day, depend on the fact that if they're hurt, there is no backup plan. There's no vacation plan. And so if you needed to work and you need to make that $100 a day and you tweaked your back and you didn't have health insurance because you didn't have a regular job, 
you couldn't get a prescription of Vicodin, you might spend $20 to buy a Vicodin pill. And if the pain didn't go away, you might do it again. And the truth of the matter is that 95% of the people who become addicted to heroin now are becoming addicted, they start on opiates that are not prescribed to them but are prescription medication. The black market for opiates is what is leading people into this. So when we talk about cannabis, when we talk about love, let's talk, forget all the other stuff. We don't want people to die. People say marijuana is the gateway drug. Marijuana is the exit drug to opiate addiction because there is no toxic level of cannabis. When we advocate for cannabis, talk about the fact that we're doing it because we love ourselves, we love our society. The last three presidents, I'm not counting our current president, the last three presidents before that all admit to the fact that they had smoked marijuana. If Bill Clinton had been arrested for the joint, smooth-talking Bill Clinton, no problem. He gets, at, he gets off the hook. If George Bush had been arrested with a joint, his dad would have gotten out of it, no problem. If Barack Obama was arrested with a joint, he could still be in jail. We know that drug laws are enforced unequally. When we talk about cannabis, talk about it in the context that we appreciate ourselves. We are not afraid to say we love humanity enough that we trust them with that decision. Marriage equality, of course, duh. That's an example of where we can say we were there first. But it's more than the fact that we were there first. In 2008, Hillary Clinton said on the campaign trail, you know, I'm in favor of civil unions, but I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. Barack Obama said the same thing. It's only 10 years ago. Three years after that, they both changed their position. And they said, you know what, we do support marriage equality. So here's the question. Did they change their opinion? Or did they think that the political climate had changed enough that they could say it safely? I think if you ask any, I've never had anybody say, oh yeah, Hillary Clinton actually changed her opinion. What happened was, she was willing to throw people under the bus. She was willing to allow the people that she was supposed to represent have their rights trampled on because she thought, that's how I win an election. When we talk to people about libertarians representing the idea that we are the philosophy, we are the party that loves humanity, we talk about tolerance. The idea that we let everybody do what they want. You can have the partner you want, you can put whatever you want into your body. And as a result, we also trust you with the ultimate Second Amendment. Okay? We accept the fact, we have made this conclusion, that in certain situations, we allow people in our society to be judge, jury, and executioner. There could be no stronger statement of our love for humanity. The fact that we recognize the fact that we all exist because of the tolerance of each other. Does anybody know who this young girl is? Anybody recognize Elizabeth Smart, who was kidnapped out of her home? Somebody came into her house, took her away, told her sister to be quiet. When we talk about the Second Amendment, we talk about defending our homes and our families, that's where we're coming from. We're talking about this idea that we have a love for ourselves, our families, our communities, that we take upon ourselves the fact that we are the ones who are responsible for taking care of each other. When we talk about Second Amendment, if we say, you can have my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers, that is nowhere near as effective as saying, I will do anything I can, anything that I must do to respect, to re protect my family, to honor the responsibility that has been laid upon me. When we talk about reaching out to people, we talk about reaching out to libertarians, we should be talking about our love for humanity. Uh, I've never even talked on a Mac before, but underneath, I'm uh, posting about uh, Dr. Susanna Hoff, who uh, was a concealed carry permit moment holder in Texas. She went into a Louis cafeteria in Colleen in 1991, and a man came in with a gun, and he started shooting the place up. She was there with her parents. She had left her gun in the glove box, as was required by law. As the man started shooting, her father instinctively charged the shooter and was shot down. And as that happened, she saw an opportunity to escape. And so she grabbed her mother by the wrist. She said, come on, Mom, we're going. And she started pulling her out the window, and her mother broke away from her and went back to be with her husband, where she was also killed. 
These people were killed because she was honoring a stupid law. We recognize the fact that our love for the people in our lives gives us a responsibility, an obligation that we must commit, and we extend the right to protect each other to all of us. The Second Amendment is not about anything else except the idea that we respect and we love our fellow people, our fellow citizens, our fellow humans with the idea that we are going to make a difference in their lives. Education. Jim Gray talked upon this this morning, and I can't tell you how happy I am. I've been to several conventions this year. This is the message that is happening, that we are changing, that we realize that we are reaching people by talking about the good things that liberty represents. When we talk about education with compassion, when we talk about the fact that what we want is a better educational system, and we talk about the fact that we want it not because we don't want to pay taxes, not because we want to make sure that our children have an economic advantage, we do it because we want everybody to have the best possible choice. Uh, there was, and I don't even remember which speaker was, we talked about the fact that right now, school choice exists. It only exists for the wealthy. Libertarians and our love for humanity want school choice to exist for everybody. Two very easy ways to talk about education right now. I'm on the campaign trail right now. We are actively hitting every college that we can. When we talk about college costs, College kids understand that. They come to the liberty movement when we say, we have created a scenario where kids are being put into debt. It makes sense. With the best of all possible intentions, in the 70s, the government decided, we wish everybody could go to college. The problem is that a lot of people can't afford to go to college. So, hey banks, why don't you give money to more people? The bank said, well, not surprisingly, we are actually in the business of giving money to people. That is our core competency. We're happy to keep doing it, but we're going to reserve the right to decide who we should give money to. The government said, well, how about this? You give a loan to a student, and we guarantee that it will be paid back with interest. And the bank said, so I give away $100, and I get back $110? The government said, yes. And then I give away $1,000, and so I get back $1,100? Yes! And I give away a million dollars. Yes, you got it! The bank said, well, we can't lose. We can't lose. And so they started giving away loans as fast as they could. Very quickly, it became apparent to the banks that they were being hampered by a college industry that wasn't offering enough crummy courses. And so they went to the colleges and said, look, we have a problem. We can't make as much money as we'd like to. Because you guys have these educational standards, it's accreditation, that means your education is worth something. We would like you to offer more, car, more courses. Some colleges went along, some held up the standards. Some people looked at it as an economic opportunity because there was an unlimited amount of money and opened up for-profit colleges so that they could get loans. This increased, and this increased. And now we have a situation where the college debt is actually the hugest financial consequence looming for our society right now. But it's easy to fix. In order to make these student loans guaranteed, the government had to take away a right that was supposed to be yours no matter what. The right to default. America was founded on the idea of no debtor's prison. If you go into debt, there are consequences, they are civil, they are not supposed to be criminal. You are not supposed to go to jail. Sadly, People actually are going to jail over college loans. Not specifically over the debt, but they get summoned into court to talk about their debt, and they get summoned, and they get summoned, and they summon, and then when they miss a summons, that becomes a criminal offense. And then they get arrested. And then they can't earn enough money to pay back their debt. It's a comedy of errors. We restore the right to default that should be guaranteed to every American. We solve this problem. But I'd like to suggest a free market solution that takes it a step further. Instead of the government guaranteeing student loans, let colleges borrow the money that they need from banks, give loans themselves. The way that it used to be, colleges used to give scholarships to people. They used to give grants. If the colleges are giving loans to students, the students no longer are customers, they are investments. If a college says, I can give this student $200,000, and if the education that I provide them is worth it, they will pay me back $250,000. That's a great return. The college is now investing 
and the student. In the free market, in the real free market, businesses look for the opportunity to invest. Now, is that going to affect the C student in high school who wants to study French literature? It is. You're not going to be able to get somebody to say, you're going to be able to pay back my loan on that. That's not our responsibility. It's not the college's responsibility. The college's responsibility is to educate. And if they are getting financially rewarded for educating people, they will do the best possible job of that. Now, we all know this chart. When we talk about it, when we talk about people, we talk to people about it, we tend to encounter opposition because people say, you know, that there's the right and there's the left. And that's it. Now, of course, if you've seen the Nolan chart, you know that there's a third dimension, up and down. Right is Republicans, beyond that is corporations controlling everything according to the left. The left is the Democratic Party, and beyond that is the state controlling everything, according to the right. Libertarians know that there is more to politics than the right and the left. It's not a two-dimensional number line, it's a three-dimensional three world. That third dimension, that third direction is up. Up is the direction of personal liberty. Up is the direction of us expressing our political love for humanity. The ability that there are certain things that we don't believe that we should have any say over. Cannabis, that's not a right issue. That's not a left issue. That's an up issue. Same-sex marriage, that's not a right issue. That's not a left issue. That's an up issue. Online gambling, that's not a right issue. That's not a left issue. That is an up issue. Those are the issues of liberty. We trust you. We trust people enough to make these decisions in their own lives. And as we do that, as we empower people, as we bring the message of liberty and the message of our love for humanity out, that's where we really start to change things and make a difference. And we talk very briefly about my campaign. I am running for auditor in the state of Massachusetts. The auditor has only one power, the ability to require every state agency to make as thorough accounting of their expenses and their receipts as the auditor deems sufficient. This is actually a wonderful office. Because a lot of times, as libertarians, if we seek an office that has power, it bothers us. The auditor has no power except to expose. I'm happy to quote Republicans sometimes, happy to quote Democrats sometimes. Louis Brandeis famously said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. As an auditor in the state of Massachusetts, I will put all the books online, real time. That information is there already. For those of you who don't live in Massachusetts, we have just had three enormous financial scandals. The most recent one is, uh, and we were talking about this earlier, I know California has the same problem with state pensions. In Massachusetts, if you are a state employee, your pension is the average of your last five years of salary. In the state police, they have this thing where the veterans, in their last year, young guys would pull their slip and punch in for them, work 40 hours, then the veterans would punch in and they would work 40 hours, and so they would get credit for 80 hours of work a week, 40 hours of overtime, they were finishing up, because they were already 20-year vets, with $320,000 a year salaries. Their pensions were based upon that. If there had been anybody auditing that, it would have shown up, but nobody cared. Our campaign slogan is, the referee shouldn't be wearing the jersey of one of the teams. When we go out and we talk about that in Massachusetts, everybody we say it just says, you're right. I'm not going to vote for a Republican. I'm not going to vote for a Democrat. When we talk about the fact that the auditor is the one position that anybody ought to be able to vote for, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, and end the idea of political tribalism, people like that idea. Because we are more divided now as a country than we have been since 1860. We are looking at a place where Republicans cannot believe any good about Democrats. Democrats believe that the Republicans are the embodiment of people on the earth. We offer the alternative, the campaign, the, the party, the idea that we love humanity. Ending the hate, bringing the love, that is libertarianism in our society. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you for your speech. Thank you. I'm actually a native Massachusetts. All right. I'm born and raised Massachusetts Democrat, now yep. libertarian in California. 
and I'm interested in... Yeah, this good good. <laughs> I'm a candidate, I'm bringing literature everywhere I go. Sounds good. Um, <coughs> interested in when you talk to members who are philosophically entrenched on both the left and the right, mm -hmm. what are some of the issues that they bring to you that you find most challenging to debate them on? And, and where have you found those workarounds? The biggest thing about it, especially in Massachusetts, where we have a really strong social safety net, is that people worry that the safety net's going to go away. So, specifically what I do for a living, I write software that supports special education now. I used to be a special education teacher. I can tell you, California, you guys are okay. In Massachusetts, we are dominatingly the best in special education. Okay? And special education is one of those things that in, when you have a child who has special needs, unless you've been through that before, you don't know where to turn. You seem lost at times. And having somebody there, that comforting state, providing an alternative, that means a lot to people. So what I like to do is I talk about the fact and say, there are alternatives out there. And in fact, sometimes the problem with the state-based solution is that it's the only one. And a lot of times I like to talk about it in terms of now in Massachusetts, you know, everybody has Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. We had Romney Care first. Whatever else you think about Romney Care, Massachusetts voted on it. We decided that it was right for us. Massachusetts at the time had an average state income of seventy-three thousand dollars. That means that we could afford a solution that is different than what makes sense in Mississippi. But whatever else you think about Romney Care, when they adopted that as the model for the national system, that ended all state-based innovation and how we were going to provide health care. Whenever the state takes over anything, education, health care, any form of regulation, it ends all the other innovation in that space. In special education in particular, we have a long history of being really wrong about what we thought worked. So specifically, I, specify, I specialize in teaching autistic students. There was a long time where people believed the state of the art was that autism was caused by the refrigerator mother the mother who did not show enough love to her child. Completely wrong. Terrible. Makes the mother feel absolutely horrible. But that was the state response because there was only one solution. When I talk about to people what you need, you need options. You need something that is larger than what the state's capable of providing because the state, by default, goes to a one-size-fits-all. Fit all. And so whenever we talk about the social safety net, I strongly say that I believe in the social safety net. I believe in a social safety net that is provided by you and me. So I want, so my, when I was teaching, we kept a closet in the nurse's station that we kept filled with food. Because uh, as crazy as it sounds in the United States, one out of five children is food insecure. Doesn't mean they're starving, it means they don't know where their next meal is coming from. So we kept that closet filled with food. Any student could always say, I need to go to the nurse's station, they could go in there, kind of look in the closet, and they could pull something out. Now, I confess, we kept apples and bananas and relatively healthy food in there. But we did that for a legitimate reason. I absolutely want to see a day that government is not providing food stamps to everybody out there. But I don't want to see that happen until you and I have stepped up to make that program irrelevant. Because it is ridiculous that people, that children are going hungry in our society. It's even more ridiculous that we need to be told, that we need to be forced at the point of a gun to make sure that that doesn't happen. I'm also born and raised in Massachusetts. I've got family in Billerica. Go back, uh, go back a couple times a year, um, and I've got two cousins. One, uh, one's at Suffolk, and one's at uh, BU. Outstanding. And uh, I'm you were also, just out of BU uh, three weeks ago. And so, so this is this is a good lead into my question. So, you know, given the you know perception that higher education is is strongly tilted away from views of libertarianism, mm -hmm. you know, I'd just be interested to hear your pers your perspective on how you've been received when you when you go talk to college. We received students. really well, so I will tell you that I came to, uh, I, I've been greatly helped, I just want to give a shout out to my campaign manager, Jeff Lyons, who uh, famously was uh, arrested at uh, Bunker Hill University, well, detained by the police at Bunker Hill University for distributing copies of the United States Constitution. <laughs> at, 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 a, at a public public university. Where you can see the USS Constitution. Exactly, you can see the boat in the background. <laughs> so, 
we have been going, we've been meeting up with any liberty group that we can. We find them growing larger and larger. So Young Americans for Liberty. We've been meeting up with college Republicans. Uh, we have been meeting up with Students for Liberty. Any liberty group that we can meet with, we go there and we find that they are growing it. And what's interesting about it is that Yao, all these organizations, they're teaching the kids the right thing. These kids are tabling events. They are actively growing their organizations and they are having more than esoteric libertarian discussions. They're having pragmatic libertarian discussions. They say, what does it mean? What does it mean for us going out in the world wanting to earn a living if there's not the liberty for us to pursue it? Right now we see the world of science doing what we believe is the ultimate goal. Machines are getting ready to step up and take the burden of work from our shoulders. When that happens, what does that mean for us in a society where we expect people to define their value by the ability to earn their living? We are honestly coming towards a day. I believe this, I, like I say all the time, I'm a software engineer. I know for a fact that the software that I write puts people out of work. What does that mean for us? What is our expectation for society? College kids are talking about us now because it's their future. And one of the most encouraging things you can hear them say is the fact that they recognize the fact that this sort of revolution has happened before and it will happen again. Agriculture used to be the most labor intensive uh, job that was available. But what used to take a thousand men to bring in from a field can now be done by one farmer with a tractor. The Industrial Revolution, the Communications Revolution, and now the Autonomous Revolution. We are going to keep transitioning our society towards one where our physical labor may be less and less required. The only threat to humanity is if people don't have the liberty to pursue other options. If they're told that the answer to that has to be your job, you're not valuable anymore, here's welfare, that's what threatens our society. If people have the opportunity to say, you know what, gig economy, I can go out and drive Uber, I can go out and braid hair, I can go out and cook. Uh, I tried to start a business in Massachusetts. Uh, we called it Fuber, which I didn't realize is a FUBAR acronym that uh, means something else entirely. <laughs> However, Fuber, food for Uber. Okay, in the North End in Boston, wonderful Italian neighborhood, there are a thousand grandmothers who want to make manicotti for you. <laughs> you ought to be able to call them up and say, hey, you know, I'm driving home, I'm coming past the North End. I'll give you 50 bucks if you put manicotti in the big Tupperware that you made for me in the afternoon. I'm like, we're going to make a lot of money doing this. Well, not in Massachusetts. The state of regulation where nobody can sell food out of their kitchen. Where else would you sell food for? As it turns out, you can get a license and in fact, a lot of restaurants do this, and they rent out their kitchens in the morning. So, we actually took it to the next level. We said, you know what, let's go to propose some legislation where people can sell food out of their house. Well, as it turns out, all the restaurants that are making money by renting out their restaurant space in the morning and after hours, they are, of course, completely opposed to that because it's money for them. I'm not worried about machines standing up and taking the burden of work away from us because humans innovate. We find ways to find meaning to our lives, and work adds meaning to our lives. Humans want to work towards meaningful things. The only thing I worry about is that regulations will get in the way. Interested in your one or two biggest concerns about the Libertarian Party today. We spend a tremendous amount of time in self-destruction. So we go back to this. Our ability to uh, you missed the slide the first time. Our ability to fight amongst ourselves is astonishing, and it's more than siblings. Because I can tell you, I have beaten my brother with a Mattel racetrack. Okay, we have fought furious battles, but that's nothing like the way libertarians go against each other. So I have the good fortune to live in a very compact area, and so I get to go see Daryl Perry, who some of you may know uh, as an avowed anarchist. And we have wonderful conversations. Uh, particularly, I like to talk about tragedy of the commons, and we'll come back to that in a second. But one of the things I talk about is I say, you know, Daryl, you want 0% government, right? It's like, that's it, I will settle for nothing less. I'm like, yes, you will settle for nothing less. And so that means that if I come up with a proposition that's going to reduce government by 50% every year, you oppose it because we'll never get to zero. 
we're hurting ourselves at that point. <laughs> and the tragedy of commons is a, is a question that I want every libertarian to think about. Because even though we talk about it as a textbook case, let me give you a real world case. So I use, I use this example in uh, New Hampshire, but it's actually probably going to make a lot more sense here in California, where you guys probably know more about water rights and water right laws than any other state in the country. Say Boomer and I live 100 miles away, and we drill into an aquifer. We can easily be pulling water from the same aquifer. As you know, if you pump water out of an aquifer, you actually cause a depression in that area, causing water from the rest of the aquifer to come towards your area. Should I be able to use my liberty on my ranch to pump all the water out of the aquifer, put it into cans, bottles, cisterns on my property, and then sell it back to everybody? I don't know what the great answer to this question is. I think, and I think we can have great conversations about it, but this idea, this idea of the tragedy of the commons, that there is a common resource that somebody has the ability to collect, to take advantage of, how do we deal with that? Those are the questions that I think we are missing the point on, because there are libertarians who believe there is an absolute concrete answer to that. And it's not. That answer varies from place to place, from locality to locality. People have to find a way to resolve those problems amongst themselves. In Massachusetts, where I live, I live on the North Shore. Uh, one town up for me is Gloucester, Massachusetts, which those of you who've seen the perfect storm are aware is a, an amazing fishing village. For a hundred years, fathers would, inherit, would pass off their fishing business to their sons. If they had two sons, that doubled the number of boats on the water. If they had three, it was more, and then the daughters started getting involved. As you may know, the, uh, the famous captain from Perfect Storm, the woman who wrote the book, one of the most famous uh, sword fishing captain women in the world. Gloucester didn't need the federal government to come in and say, you are fishing the ocean dry. It became apparent to all of them. And so they actually formed a contract amongst themselves, saying this is how we protect this resource. But now, it's controlled by the federal government. It's controlled by people from Alaska and Florida. Nobody from Massachusetts has any say, any say in how fishing is done in Massachusetts. And the worst imposition is that if you sail out to swordfish for tuna out of Gloucester, you have to pay $800 every trip to have a federal inspector on the boat with you who makes sure that you're throwing back the fish you're supposed to throw back. You're not catching the fish you're not supposed to catch. That's my biggest worry about what stuff's going on that's happening in the future. Those are the things that we have to worry about. This idea that in the name of protecting the environment, we actually are hurting everybody else. People have an incentive to make sure that they prosper. They have an incentive to make sure that everybody else prospers. Because if I'm rich and you're not, and I make things that cost a billion dollars, you can't buy them. I'm doing it wrong. So I need you to be wealthy as well. Public schools, of course, libertarians don't like the idea that you are collecting money at the point of a gun and funding a school system with it. But we don't hate the idea that there's going to be a society out there of people who are earning a lot of money so we can sell them things. We love that idea. If we talk about that's what we want, we want a society where people, we're generating customers, consumers, innovators. We don't have to say that we hate schools. We say that we want the best possible system that comes out of that. Those are the changes when we talk about our love for humanity. Libertarianism needs the expression of that love for humanity. That's where I think we really reach people. Yeah. Yes? Oh, am I done? No, no, no. Uh, put, uh, put your website back up. <coughs> okay. I'm going to exchange over. Uh, this is my good campaign manager as opposed to my bad campaign manager. Oh, I meant yeah, the slide with the website. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'll go to the main website. Soon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lot tighter. How does it look? I just put the slide. Yep. Yeah, so real quick, I just want to say a couple things about Dan. I've been managing his campaign since October. Um, Dan, uh, obviously, you run for auditor. Uh, he's, as you've seen today, he's an excellent uh, ambassador for liberty. He's an excellent communicator. Talks like this that he's come up with, he's written himself. I've had the opportunity to see him give them multiple times to kind of polish that material. He's an excellent, excellent communicator. And uh, I believe that if we can get him in front of 
as many uh, Massachusetts voters as possible that there's a real chance that we can win this uh, election against a corrupt incumbent Democrat that has used her office as a weapon against a Republican, de uh, uh, Republican governor, has made deals with unions to secure endorsements, and done the audits in ways that hurt uh, the Republican Party and in ways that have helped herself politically. Settled a lawsuit after for wrongful termination, firing her first deputy, uh, who was formerly her campaign manager. It's $115,000 the taxpayers had to pay uh, because the first deputy auditor told, uh, the, the former campaign manager told this woman, you're not allowed to use the office of the auditor to run your re-election out of it. It violates campaign election, it violates fairness laws. That's against the law, I'm telling you that. So, uh, in order for being, you know, uh, a, 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 a whistleblower. Yeah, a whistleblower, she was effectively fired from her job and the taxpayers had to pick up that tab. Uh, lots of scandals going on here. Um, on, be, uh, on behalf of Dan, we have uh, gotten him in front of a lot of college Republican uh, student groups, trying to convert them to the ideas of liberty. We actually got him invited to the Massachusetts College Republicans statewide uh, convention. Uh, he was the first speaker uh, to be invited to speak there. Before any Republican agreed to speak there, you know, Dan Fishman was invited uh, and agreed to speak there. Uh, we got told after some higher ups in uh, the mass GOP and the national, national aspect of the GOP found out Libertarian was speaking at the Republicans, uh, they said you have to disinvite them. And so they offered us a table set up. And when they got wind that we had a table set up, uh, they said, no, you can't let them have a table set up, but you can still come and canvas. Well, we came, we canvassed, uh, we, we commandeered our own table. And uh, to be honest, I think we had uh, more of a presence there than any Absolutely. other uh, we were, Republican candidate's campaign. We were the dominant campaign. Uh, so uh, as Chairman Sarwark said earlier, uh, when, uh, when you're over the target, the target's on your back, or something along those lines. <laughs> so as soon as we did that, and we were uh, uh, showing a stronger campaign, I mean, we had at least a dozen or two dozen volunteers and activists. Everybody's under the age of 30. It's the youngest campaign uh, that's running in the state of Massachusetts right now. Um, and nobody in this campaign is accepting any money. I'm not accepting any money. I'm doing this because I think that Dan's message is strong, and that it's a campaign race that we can win. Let me interject there. I want a paycheck. <laughs> that happens. You guys go to automassachusetts.com. You tell your friends about it. Okay? It doesn't take much. We raised about $20,000 right now. At $25,000, we're going to qualify for matching funds. Okay? We believe that we can win this race with $100,000. So that's what we're looking for. Don't make Jeff go hungry. Automassachusetts.com. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. That being said, uh, after, after we stepped on some toes with the GOP saying there's no Republican in the race, it's just a Libertarian versus a Democrat. Fiscally responsible, pro-liberty guy, you know, side with us, let us, you know, you don't have a dog in this fight, then, you know, just back us up. And uh, what, uh, on a strategy level, I think that we, we, we kicked the bee's nest and a uh, Republican candidate entered the race last minute, 10 days left to collect signatures. Are they going to be able to do it? We don't know. But what we do need to do is make sure that the Fishman campaign looks really strong and that it's going to be an embarrassment for the GOP to come in third in November if they do get on the ballot. So if you guys would kindly help us do that, uh, automassachusetts.com, the maximum that you can give is $1,000 uh, per person. So if anybody's willing to do that, I won't fault you if you'd like to give us less. But yeah, but how many, how many uh, signatures does the Republican need to get? 5,000. 5,000 signatures. They can only collect, major parties are only allowed to collect from unenrolled voters and members of their own party. So, uh, as Governor Weld said, we did a signature turn-in on Wednesday. Governor Weld came. It was, uh, we got pretty good press out of it. We actually had the hardest lift of all because we can only collect signatures from the 52% of the electorate that is unenrolled or the 8,000 registered libertarians in Massachusetts. Unenrolled, you mean not registered? So, so unenrolled, not affiliated. Unenrolled. Massachusetts has a special thing that if you are not in one of the major parties, you are considered unenrolled. We also have open primaries for unenrolled. And so, specifically, the Democrats who have run the game for forever set up the system that way. They want you to not be in another party because if you're in another party, you can't vote in the Democratic primary, which is the only election in town. 
Massachusetts, with the exception of Scott Brown, has not been elect elected a Republican at the federal level since 1994. Uh, we have elected a few Republican governors, mainly on the strength of Governor Weld, and then people on his staff who have represented an idea. Solution of, Governor Baker. Yep, Solution Governor Baker, uh, Kerry Healy as well, and Mitt Romney famously. Uh, there is, uh, Massachusetts is a unique state, and I know you guys are blue, but we're crazy blue. Uh, <laughs> and the only elections that really matter are the Democratic primaries, and they have been using that as a system to keep us in boxes. This campaign represents the place where we break out of the box. It represents the idea politics should become second to people. Principle should come before party. We elect a person to a position that should always be independent. The referee shouldn't be wearing a jersey of one of the teams. When we say that to people, it resonates. I really am going to need your help. The worst thing for running for office is the ask. This is my ask. Tell your friends. I don't know how we got so many Massachusetts connections in the room. <laughs> Tell your friends back home. We can win this race. I intend to win this race. It has to be more than just me and Skinny Jeff. <laughs> Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube, and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.